cause. So, you know, for the last several months, we've been talking in and out about stronger families. And tonight, I wanted to approach this topic from a slightly different perspective and share tonight how to build a stronger family from a young adult perspective of someone who's maybe not married or maybe you're not even dating yet or from the perspective of a high schooler who you don't even have a girlfriend on the radar and you're like several years away from starting your own family or as a single person who maybe you're recently divorced and you're still trying to figure out what your new normal is or even as a grandparent. Somebody who, who maybe you've lost a loved one that you spent 30 plus years with and now you're learning to meander a new season of life, one that is completely different from just a few years before. And, and here's where we want to start. This is our first point. If you have your Westover app, we must learn to recognize who your family is. Learn to recognize who your family is. If you remember, there was a conversation that the Pharisees in the New Testament had with Jesus. And the Pharisees asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And the Pharisees were expecting Jesus to give this very politically correct, like Jewish certified type answer. But instead, Jesus challenged their racial prejudice Jesus challenged their political affiliations and even their religious practices and their sense of self-righteousness by asking them to redefine who their neighbor was. And so for us, the question is very similar. We're asking, who is your family? Now, the obvious answer, it's the people that you do life with. If you're in high school, it may be your crazy, annoying, slash hilarious little brother Or it may be your super adorable slash ultra clingy sweet little sister. Or that older sibling that you look up to, but you would never for a million years ever admit that you look up to them. It may be your mom and dad. It may be your step siblings. If you're a young adult, it may be your family back home in Corpus or on the south side of San Antonio or in Houston. And these may be the obvious answers. The people who share your last name. The people that you call mom or dad. But tonight we want to take it just a step further and ask the question and redefine family just a little bit broader by asking, who are the people that you do life with? And if you remember, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29, he said, and everyone who has given up houses and brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. You see, here's Jesus And he's sharing that those of us who begin to follow him wholeheartedly, even when it's hard, even when our parents disagree with us following after God, even when our siblings may call us names and distance themselves from us, we stand to gain more brothers, more sisters, and more family than we even began with. Christian brothers and sisters. And we're all made one family because of the work that Jesus has done for us. When Jesus died to rescue us, he brought us all together. In 1 John chapter 3, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished upon us, that we would be called sons and daughters of God. And this is what we are. Romans 8.29 says it like this, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Friends, tonight, because of what Jesus has done for us, we all have the privilege of broadening and redefining our definition of family to include other followers of Jesus in this room. We get to broaden our definition of family to include the followers of Jesus down the road at Gateway, down the road at Cornerstone, at CBC, at Oak Hills, all around the city, all around the nation, and all around the world. So when you feel alone because you're living in a strange city or in a quiet apartment by yourself, when you're missing your parents who may live far away or who are no longer with us, or when you don't have that boyfriend or that girlfriend around anymore or that spouse that you spent so many years making memories with, friends, it is so important that we recognize that our family is our best friends that love Jesus. That our family is our life group and the people that we serve with. Our family is our posse, our gang, our gente. This is our family. 
And so with this in mind, it is appropriate to begin applying the principles that we've discussed throughout this entire series to these family members also. Because your family isn't just your mom and your stepdad. Your family isn't just those. According to God's word, it includes everyone, all of us who love Jesus. And with this in mind from here, we must, number two, learn to thrive within the context of our family. For instance, is one of your parents a great cook? I think, you know, if I were related, if Pastor Will was my dad, like I would be set for life. I would be unstoppable. Are one of your parents handy and they're able to just fix everything? Then try to pick up some of that. Try to work with them a little bit. If, one, if your parents are still happily married, that's amazing. Learn from them. Ask them questions. Replicate that. But let me tell you, if your family is disjointed and splintered, let's learn from that too. Sometimes the lesson of what not to do can be a better teacher to us than what to do ever could. And I would encourage you, learn from your mom what she wished she would have done differently. How she would have really focused on her relationship with God before allowing her heart to be stolen. Or how she would not have talked down to her husband so many times throughout the years. Learn from your dad what he would have changed about himself and his own choices if he could go back in time. Maybe he would have been more physically present. Maybe he would have spent more time listening. Learn from their heartache. Learn from their regret. And friends, if you grew up distant from one of your parents, if you grew up at odds with one of your siblings, then learn from that too. How do you wish you would have been treated? How do you wish things would have turned out differently and decide that in the future you're going to treat your kids that way? You're going to treat the people around you that way. And then make a decision however you can, as soon as you can, and do whatever it takes to make things right while they're still alive. If you remember the story of the prodigal son, the young adult who asked for his inheritance from his dad while his dad was still alive. Now, culturally, this would have been like a slap in the face to his dad. This would have been the cultural equivalent of saying, you know, I wish you were dead already so that I could just live my life the way I want to. And if you recall in the story, this young adult chose to forsake the family business, his parents, and even put his siblings at a distance, and in the end... His dad still wants him back. Although his dad's heart was pierced, although he was deeply wounded by his son, in that moment he cared more that things be made right with his son than that all of his son's wrongs be made right. Let me say that again. In that moment, the dad, the father, he cared more that things be made right with his son than that all of his son's wrongs be made right. In other words, Relationship first, everything else later. Forgiveness first, everything else later. And as we continue, I think it's so interesting that of all the metaphors God could have used to describe his relationship with us, one of the examples he chose was the bride of Christ. And in this example, I just think it's so cool that God chose to illustrate his unique relationship with us by using the family. Because he could have illustrated this any way he wanted to. It could have been the boss of Christ and the employees of Christ, right? How many of you are like, I'm so glad it's not that one? It could have been the the lead singer of Christ and then the backup singers of Christ. You know, I'm like, I'm glad I'm not doing BGVs, you know? The quarterback of Christ and the defensive line of Christ. Like, it could have gone so many ways. But he chose family, He chose marriage, and with this metaphor, God is saying that marriage implies intimacy, so your relationship with God should be close. It should be near. Marriage implies unity, so your relationship with God could and should be in agreement. Marriage implies encouraging, so your relationship with God shouldn't be just this exhausting to-do list of things I will and I won't do this week. But it should be life-giving and energizing and supportive. Marriage implies brutal honesty, and so many other things. And God shows this metaphor because of how relatable it is to us and the example provided by a healthy family system, I believe, is at the core of what he wants to do in our lives. So as we expand the definition of family to include our brothers and sisters who love Jesus, we must ask, 
What does intimacy look like with the people that I do life with? What does unity look like? What does encouraging look like to my best friends? What does brutal honesty look like to my life group and to those that I serve with? Romans 12, 4 says this, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. And I love this idea. That instead of God choosing to make us all carbon copies of each other, right? You're like, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. If God were to make us all like exactly the same, I wonder who we would all be like, right? Like, can you imagine? Like we were all like just Pastor Jim's. You know, like just these, these redheaded people, you know, and we're, we're, we're eating queso, you know, and we're reading the Bible. You know, can you imagine? Or I, I, don't, I don't know, we, we're all Billy Graham, you know? I mean, that would be really funny. Some of you ladies would look very, very interesting if that were the case. But here's what the Scripture's telling us. It's almost as if Paul is taking this idea of the bride of Christ, this metaphor, and furthering it to say this is what the bride would look like from Ephesians 5 and 2 Corinthians 11. And he says it's here that he's sharing this idea that we all have unique roles. We all have unique functions. We have unique contributions that we add to the body. We add to the bride, to the family, when we choose to show up. And here's a a beautiful example of what this could look like if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Titus chapter 2. We're going to spend a little bit of time here in Titus chapter 2. Here's Paul. And Paul's writing a letter of instruction to one of his spiritual sons, a non-Jewish believer named Titus, who Paul actually brought to Christ. And this this is a a non-Jewish believer turned pastor. And here are the words that Paul encourages Titus with. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. I know some of you are like elbowing your grandma. You're like, "Mm, I told you, Abelita, right? Instead, (laughs) instead they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and pure, to work in their homes to be good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Gentlemen, like, watch out. Like, don't, don't just start flipping around this scripture and, like, this is my life verse, okay? Like, the, I'm just telling you, it didn't work for me. It may not, you know. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. Now, don't miss this. I know this is not the most popular passage for the modern-day feminist. But I want you to hear Paul's heart here. Paul is saying that within the context of family... Coaching and mentoring should be happening. Don't miss it. In other words, if you are a seasoned Christian woman with years and years and years of life experience, it is good that you would spend time with younger women who are just now learning and beginning to start their families. Not so you can tell them everything that they should be doing, but rather so that you can show them what you are doing. And they can ask questions and they can discover for themselves. Because the truth is, people don't retain truth when you dump it on it. People retain truth when they discover it for themselves. And many of you know that. You know that that when you were in school and and the teacher was like, well, you need to know this, this, and this. You, You didn't quite get it. It was like, okay, well, maybe I'll need that one day, but probably not. But when you discover it for yourself, it makes all the difference. And I'll tell you what, in our family... We have a handful of people that pour into our lives. We're so grateful for ladies like Miel Pridemore. Uh, many of you know Miel. She's amazing. I love, love the way that she spends time just talking with my wife. And you see, Miel is somebody who's been married longer than Melissa and I have. She has a, a teenager and she has a, a young adult daughter who are absolutely amazing. And, and when we look at their lives, and they've been, even been in ministry longer than we have, and when we look at, our, at their lives, we say, man, we want our kids to love Jesus the way your kids love Jesus. We want our kids to be close to each other the way your kids are close to each other. And so here, we, we gladly say, yes, please, please spend time with us. We want to learn from you and from your example. 
then if you're, you are maybe the younger Christian woman and you're, you're married and you have kids, it is good that you would spend time with our young adults who are single and maneuvering the world of dating just so they can see what it looks like to be just one or two steps further down the road. It's been so breath, breathtaking to see how my wife turns around and does this same thing for others. You see, my wife has, has a group of high schoolers and young adults that come over to our house. They kick me out of the house. They say, we don't care what you're going to do. You just can't do it here, Pastor Tito. And they, they turn our house into like this, this girl sanctuary, and they'll stay up and like drink coffee from the Keurig and, and just talk about life. And I'm so, so grateful, so grateful to see somebody like my wife pouring into the lives of others, just the way Miel pours into my Melissa, Melissa pours into these girls. And if you're one of those young adults and you're going through the world of college and dating and working, man, it is good that you would spend time with our high schoolers and that you would spend time with our middle schoolers mentoring them and imparting the wisdom you have, letting them see what it looks like to be a Christian who's out of school, to be a Christian, maybe some of you who are living out of your parents' home. And can I tell you, that of that group that my wife spends time with, many of them are leading life groups for our young adults and for our high schoolers and middle schoolers. Girls like Rosie and Bria who are out there and they're just being Jesus with skin on to other people. And if you're a high schooler, listen, it is good that you would spend time with other high schoolers, that you would spend time with middle schoolers and with our kids, investing in them and showing them what God has shown you, like so many of you do already, like Kristen and Liza and Anna and Eddie and Jake and Tim and Brayden and a million others that I could name. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's awesome. That's so awesome. But friends, what I'm trying to say is that this is what a healthy family does. A healthy family, they receive coaching, they receive mentoring, they receive instruction, and then they pass it on to somebody else. You see, we we are not called to become spiritually obese. And so many of us as Christians, that we have become, we have become masters at conviction, but we become failures at action. So many of us, we're so good at receiving and saying, oh, that hurt. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, Lord, you're right but we don't turn around and pour into the next generation. And it's within this context that we can thrive. It's within this context that you can see that you are qualified to serve, not because you have a degree or you don't have a degree, not because you're so much smarter than everybody else around you, but because you bring fresh perspective, because you bring a new vantage point, because you bring different experiences to the table, and on top of that, you have unique gifts that you can share. Some of you are such an excellent judge of character that you could smell a phony and a fake from miles away and we could all benefit from your discernment. So, some of you who like just broke up with some of you are like, mama was right. Yeah, because she knows. Some of you are so sweet and hospitable. We could learn from you in the way that you give and give and give. Some of you, when you pop those bunuelos out of the oven, it is just like heaven on earth. Please teach somebody that. Please. Some of you are so strong and faithful. We can all benefit from your stick to and your grit. Some of you are so patient that you don't squirm and get defeated and depressed when things don't go your way. Listen, we need you. And additionally, 1 Corinthians 12 says this, and I think this verse is just so valuable and so important. If you would circle this, highlight this in your Bibles, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. One part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Friends, a healthy family cares for its sick members. It's like this silly joke that my dad used to tell me. That there was this little boy and his little sister and mom, and they were walking down the road, and and they were just walking. And so little brother, he had this Vero Mango Lucas chili pop thing, and he accidentally drops it. So he stoops down to pick it up, and his mom goes, Mijito, no, don't do it. And he's like, why, (laughs) right? She's like, don't do it. The devil licked it. You know, he's like, okay. And, you know, he trusts his mom, so they they just keep on walking down the road. A few minutes later, here's little sister. 
She accidentally drops her little Disney animators collector's princess Anna doll, the one with the big anime-looking eyes that her dad paid $26.95 from the Disney store, plus tax, but he's not bitter. So she, she reaches down and pick, her, pick up the little doll, and her mom stops her and says, no, mijita, don't do it. She's like, let it go, let it go. She's like, mama, why? She's like, the devil licked it. She's like, but it's okay, mijita, the cold never bothered her anyway, right? And they just, they just keep walking. And then they're not paying attention, and they're just having a good little walk. And the next thing you know, mom trips on a rock, and she falls into a little pothole in the middle of the road. You know where this is going. Little brother, little sister look at each other. Mama's like, mijo, mijita, pick me up. And they're like, no, mama, the devil licked you. The worst, right? The worst. But a healthy family, unlike this illustration, cares for its sick members. A healthy family doesn't abandon mama when she's fallen and she can't get up. A healthy family doesn't abandon little brother on the side of the road when he skins his knee from his bicycle. A healthy family doesn't say, hey, daddy good luck passing that kidney stone. I bet that one's going to hurt a lot, right? That's not what a good family does. And in the same way, When your sister in Christ is going through a hard breakup, friends, listen, this is when we amp up the care. This is when you decide, you know what, I'm going to take my sister dinner for a couple nights in a row. I'm going to buy her two pints of Blue Bell. I'm going to rent the Redbox movie starring Matthew McConaughey. I'm going to spend time with her. I'm going to make an investment because this is what families do. And all the ladies are like, did you say Matthew McConaughey? Oh, my gosh. Listen, when your little brother, when your Christian brother is struggling with still being single after all this time, we don't just say, suck it up, bro. Some of you do. (laughs) When your family hurts, you hurt too. You don't offer a one-liner and just move on. You invest your time and your energy into them. You learn to stop what you're doing and pray for them right there, if at all possible. And we've got to learn to thrive this way. This, my friends, is why life groups are such a big deal. This is why, because we teach our elementary age kids that they should live life within a community, that they should have a few that they're doing life with. We teach our middle schoolers and our high schoolers that they should learn to have honest conversation about the things that matter to them with the people that matter to them. And this is why it is vital for you as a young adult For you as a single, for you as a professional, for you as a high schooler, as a married person, as a grandparent, that you would have a family that you were doing life with because we learn best from each other. And family also teaches us important lessons about the roles of authority in our lives. Have you ever noticed that the older you get, the more authority you seem to live under? Now, now, just kind of go with me here for a moment. When you're a baby, your parents, they, they're pretty much your only boss. Other than that, you get to eat anywhere you want. Anywhere. In, in the middle of a movie theater. A- anywhere you want. You, you get to lounge around naked anywhere you want because you're a kid. Or you're a baby, right? I mean, seriously, there are not a whole lot of rules for these precious little freeloaders. Hey, you know, the kid's like, hey, I think I want to just pee right now through my diaper in the middle of Walmart before my mom's even halfway through the grocery list. And they just do it. Or, hey, I think I want to poo right now through my diaper even though I'm on the slide at Peter Piper's and there are like 20 kids behind me. It's all good. (laughs) And then when you're in elementary, you have your parents, but now you also have your family and your teachers and your principals. They're all your boss. Slowly but surely, your freedoms are being taken away. Now you could get in real trouble for just peeing anywhere, okay? (laughs) The school system is so oppressive these days, right? And then in high school, once you get your driver's license, you can add coaches and band directors and every police officer on that road to that list of people with authority over you. You could add your insurance company. If you get a girlfriend, you can add her too. You can add her dad to that list as well. When you turn 18... You can now be tried as an adult, so the law is now your new boss, and if that isn't enough authority, you can add your boss over at SeaWorld, you could add the student loans you're about to take out. Once you get married, you have all these things plus your spouse and her family. Once you have kids, you could add them to that list as well. And I think there's a valuable lesson in this. We don't get more freedom without getting more responsibility. 
We don't get more freedom without having more authority over our lives. And so hear me when I say this. I think there are many of us in this room that are not as far as we think we should be in life because we have not learned to operate wisely under the role of authority that we've been placed under. If we cannot get along with our parents, how are we going to get along with our boss? If we can't stand our annoying siblings, how are we going to stand our coworkers who disagree with us that we just, we just cannot fathom spending any more time with? This is such a big deal. Number three, we must learn ways to further your current family. What can I do now to help those around me? To those people I live with, am I pulling my weight? If I'm a roommate, if I'm a husband, am I providing for my family? Am I taking care of the bills? Am I helping around the house? Doing dishes can go a long way, I've discovered. Am I supporting and encouraging my grown-up kids in front of their kids, or am I undermining them? Am I making space for other valuable relationships in my life, even if I'm missing the one relationship that I crave and miss the most? Am I giving an example of what it looks like to be a a Christ follower to those around me? For instance, does your family see you reading the Bible? Does your family see you making difficult decisions, not based on what would benefit you, but based on what's actually right? Does your family see you supporting the church financially? Do they see you paying for scholarships for kids who can't make it to kids camp or teenagers who can't afford the student conference? Friends, we have to lead by example. And let me just say this, if you would never step foot in a men's conference or a women's conference, it's a very big leap for your middle schooler and your high schooler to be confident enough to sign up for a student conference. We have to be wise in these moments. We have to be wise with these opportunities that God has given us to further our families. And listen, in just one month, we're going to have a huge opportunity for you, every teenager within the sphere of your influence to get a chance to collide with the one person who has the power to change everything about their story. And his name is Jesus. And parents, <laughs> amen, amen. Parents, grandparents, students, don't miss the opportunity to invest in what could be the moment when a young person's life is completely changed. I'd encourage you, if you're in high school, if, you have a, if you're a young adult and you have a job, why don't you pray about sponsoring somebody this year? It can change somebody's life forever. And because we all have unique roles, we all have unique influence, and we have to ask, are we wielding that influence wisely? Am I spending any time with my younger siblings? Am I spending any time with the younger couples around me? Am I investing in others and sharing what I've been given? And to the people who count on me, how am I showing that I'm dependable? Do my parents know they can count on me for anything and not to remind me a thousand times? Do my friends know that I'll be there for them no matter what and never lie to them just because it's easier than the truth? Do my bosses know that when I say I'll be there, I really will, and I won't call in sick at the last minute? And number four, learn to ask yourself, what am I doing now to build my future family? What am I doing now to build my future family? And this is such a big conversation, and its roots are in character and integrity. And for the high schoolers and the young adults and for the singles in the room, This may look like asking yourself, am I dating the kind of people I'd want to marry? Or am I just just playing around? It may look like, am I becoming the kind of person that I want to marry? These habits I have, do they need some work? These patterns I display, do they need addressing? These attitudes, do they need adjusting? I'd encourage you, let's be very honest as we look for answers to these questions. Listen to these words, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
Friends, as we talk future family, as we talk God's will, Paul is telling us that in order to get where we want to go, we've got to learn to submit our minds to the Lord and allow him to change the very way we think and renew our mind through his word. I love this quote. It says, you can trace the failure or success of every man to something he permitted daily to occur in his life or in his body or in his mind. Friends, this requires working out and flexing your discipline muscles and not allowing them to atrophy with compromise and laziness. This is changing the negative, undisciplined way you think with God's word and his truth about you and about your situation. This is getting to know Jesus by spending time, time in prayer and time in his word. This is constantly saying your best yes and continually saying no to everything fruitless, to everything toxic in your life, to every relationship that doesn't belong. This is constantly saying yes to Jesus so that you know what obedience feels like, so that you know what it feels like to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Man, thank God that we don't have to live this Christian life alone. Thank God that we don't have to be strong Christians on our own strength. That when we're weak, his strength is made perfect in us. That it's his grace that carries us forward to continue. And I would ask this question tonight. As everybody, if you would bow your heads and close your eyes. The question is, how am I building my legacy? How am I building my legacy? How do I want to be remembered Do I lose my cool with those I care about? Is my fuse just very, very short? Do I intentionally make time for the people I call my family? Am I going from glory to glory and becoming more like Jesus every day? Carve your name on hearts, not tombstones. Carve your name on hearts, not tombstones. A legacy is etched into the minds of others and the stories that they share about you. Father, right now, we just want to take a moment and I pray for every person in this room. Father, for every person in this room, that you would help us to live in light of the word that you've taught us tonight. Regardless, if somebody here is in high school or a young adult, or married, or married with kids, or their grandparents are single, or whomever they are, may it be that every one of us does what it takes now to build a stronger family then. For the lonely, please open our eyes to see the family we have around us. For those in this room who are struggling and hurting, God, give us all eyes to see our sisters and our brothers that are really going through something. And not just reach out with a one-liner, but reach out with our lives. Lord, for those that are going through something, Lord, I pray you give them the courage to seek out a life group and begin doing life with other people that could become their best friends. For the hurting, God, give us eyes to notice them and ears to just listen when they need someone to be in their corner. Help us to really be the body of Christ to these. For those in the room who struggle with authority or those watching online, Lord, help us to learn these hard lessons now before it really derails our future and sets us up for bitterness and long-term resentment. Lord, for the hopeful, please continue to energize them and remind them that your promises are yes and amen and that you still love them and you still have a plan for their lives and you still want to unfold the desires of their hearts, the ones that you've placed there. Father, help us all to be more intentional about making the most of our time with our families. The people with our last name, but also our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would not waste a moment, but we'd invest every minute. Father, we just invite you to do what only you can do. God, that right now your Holy Spirit 
would speak to every heart in this room, every heart that's watching. What would you have us do with what we've heard? How can I leave a legacy? What things about my life do I not want my grandchildren to remember about me? What things in my life do I not want others to remember when they see my face or when they hear my name? Holy Spirit, we just invite you to begin changing us on the inside. May we not be masters at conviction, but failures at action. Instead, may we be doers and hearers of the word. In the name of Jesus, we love you and we trust you and we're so grateful for another chance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Friends, we love you. We think you're amazing. You are officially